economy. I am more and more convinced as I study that this is one of the most important books in the Bible. Deuteronomy is the, uh, the key. If you have a master key, um, if you have a master key that unlocks a whole bunch of different locks, Deuteronomy is the master key. Uh, it, it helps us to understand all the kings. It helps us to understand the book of Joshua. It helps us to understand the whole Old Testament. But it actually helps us to understand the New Testament in a new way as well. The book of Hebrews in particular makes way more sense after you understand the book of Deuteronomy. I don't want to study Deuteronomy just to explain what happened to the Israelites. Um, I think there's huge application for us today. And being Father's Day, I'm going to tell you that the audience um, for the book of Deuteronomy is, I think, for fathers. Um, not saying that moms shouldn't listen. It's anyone in leadership over somebody else. What we're seeing in the book of Deuteronomy, giving you some context here, is a moving from one generation to the next generation. So let's walk through the story. We started in the book of Exodus. We see Genesis. We saw Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I just ignore up here. It's going to be a little delayed, so you'll see. Yeah, That'll drive you nuts if you watch that and you watch me. Uh, I can see some of you like, oh, I'm getting sick already. Uh, just ignore it. It has to be up there to record. So anyway, let's carry on. Let, let's start in the book of Genesis. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, good summary of Genesis. We come to, um, through Joseph, they end up in Egypt. In Egypt, they end up in slavery, which we find them in Exodus. And God says, uh, to, sends Moses, let my people go, he tells them. And Pharaoh says, no, I will not let the people go. And God sends plagues on the, the Egyptian people, right up to the point of the firstborn. We talked about that in communion today, um, and how God delivered them through the blood, and then through the waters, brings them up to the Red Sea, and they are at a point of no return. They can't go back to Egypt. They're going to be killed if they go back. They can't go forward because of the sea, so God makes a way through the water, and go through the water, and enter into, into the land, uh, that, the direction that they're supposed to be going, and God takes them into the wilderness and to Mount Sinai, where they receive the law. They're at Mount Sinai for about a year, and so you see the book of Leviticus and the first part of Numbers, and then you see them wandering, which you spend most of the book of Numbers in the wandering time. They wander around for 40 years. Is that me? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I thought it was my phone or something. But they went into, went into uh, wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years, and so, just coming up onto the promised land now, where they were supposed to be going, coming up onto the promised land, Moses stops. And they stop, and this is where we're going to find Deuteronomy. They're going to stay here for just a little while, and Moses is going to explain to them again what happened at Mount Sinai. Why? Because they wandered around for 40 years. Now, 40 years is enough time for one generation to pass away in the wilderness, and yet for a new generation to to have the choice now, are they going to grumble and complain and disobey God? Or are they going to go in and take possession of the land? So they're faced with a choice in the book of Deuteronomy. Choose who you're going to serve. Are you going to choose life? Or are you going to choose death? Which one are you going to do? And so generationally, what you're going to see here is a reminder from Moses to the fathers. Moses is passing this information on to Joshua, who will then continue to lead the people. And he's also going to tell the fathers, pass this on to your sons and your daughters. Teach them while you, while you walk and while you move around. I want you to pass this on to the next generation so that they will walk faithfully with me. So Deuteronomy is going to be a summary, a reminder of key points, a reminder of key things that happened in their past, and encouraging them to move forward into the promised land. So this is going to be, uh, for us, a reminder of what God has done for us, there's those great reminders. We're going to be reminded over and over again of the love of God. If you want to really be encouraged by Deuteronomy, I'm told you sit down and read the whole thing at once. It takes about three hours. Okay? So there's your homework. I'm going to do it this week. I promise I'm going to do it this week. Um, and and I'm, I'm actually kind of excited to do it. If you don't want to read it, take some time and listen to it. Listen to the audio Bible version of it and take three hours if you really want to do that and listen to it in one chunk and just be... Um, be encouraged because this is not all laws, rules, thou shalt nots. This is God reminding his people of how good he has been to them and how much promise he has for them. And the importance of that is to give them courage 
to move them forward. So my hope is that in studying the book of Deuteronomy is that we will also move forward in our faith. Maybe there's some here that have for a long time sat stagnant. They have grown complacent. We have been wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. Maybe that's been your spiritual journey. You spent 40 years wandering around, not really growing, not really moving into the promises of God, and you're just wanting to move forward, and I think there's hope for us here. So, the audience is this. The audience is for all of God's people. It is for leaders, and and it is for people who are wandering, who are floundering in their faith. It is meant for kings and leaders. I want to take you to one passage just before we jump in, Deuteronomy chapter 17. Let's breeze over to Deuteronomy chapter 17. 17 and verse 18. So every time Israel set up a new king, this is what this king was supposed to do. Um, Deuteronomy 17, 18. And when he, the king, the new king, sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of the law approved by the Levitical priests. They were supposed to sit down and write the book of Deuteronomy. So listening to it takes about three hours. How long do you think it would take to write the book of Deuteronomy out? Transcribe it by hand. Three days? Three weeks? I have no idea. (laughs) What's that? This? I didn't. Some other, I wish. You're not going to make me do it either. I'm not doing it. There's one of the professors at Miller actually chose to give his students the assignment. They could write a a research paper on the book of Romans, or they could write it out by hand, but it had to be without error. And so everyone's just like, yeah, this will be great. All I have to do is try. I don't have to do any thinking. I just have to write out the book of Romans. Well, it takes an extremely long time, and then what they found is that students would write and miss a verse and have to scrap it all because they weren't supposed to have any errors. It was meant to show them how hard it would be to get the copies of the Bible into our hands today the way that they are. Imagine that. But every king was supposed to take this for more than just to passing on the information. It was meant to guide that king's life because that king was responsible then to lead the next generation of people in a right and godly way. And so the king was supposed to have this on his mind as he led the people. He was supposed to lead according to God's standards. Imagine if our rulers today would do something like that that they would know the mind of God and lead in accordance with what the mind of God was. Did that work really well in Israel's history even? No, not at all. The vast majority of the kings did not do this. So if you want some, some other homework after you finish reading the book of Deuteronomy, why don't you go to the book of 2 Kings and read uh, chapter 21 to chapter 23, and you get the story of Manasseh and Josiah. You heard those names before? Manasseh was a terrible king. You get that story in, in chapter 21, and it, it, tells him about, it tells about him sacrificing his own child. Uh, he just was a horrible human being. He had wandered so far from the Lord, and the rest, of the, um, the rest of the nation started to follow after him. No wonder. I mean, that was just the leadership that was there. But he ruled for like 50 years. And after him comes Josiah, a young king, very young and Early in his reign, he comes to someone discovers a book of the law, and he realizes we have gone way too far. We have gone way far away from what God intends. And it says that he tore his clothes and he fell on his face before God and he repented. And so I'm not sure which one we're at. I don't know. And maybe you're going to realize as we're studying this that you have wandered really far from God. Um, Just know that God can restore. He does that with Josiah. Um, But it means that we have to come to terms with what God desires. We don't do this on our own terms. And so we, uh, we know that God can restore. We know that God has great plans. God intends to bless, not to curse, but he warns us that if we disobey him, um, then we will uh, fall under his curse as well. So shall we jump in? Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 1. These are the words, uh, which is basically the title of the book in, in the Jewish text. These are the words um, 
that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness, in the Arabah, uh, opposite of Suf. <laughs> this is what making Deuteron- makes Deuteronomy so fun to read, is all the names. Between Paran and Tophel, when you're reading it by yourself, you don't have to say them all. Laban, Hazroth, and das- <laughs> that place. Uh, it is... It is 11 days' journey from Horeb, or Sinai, by the way of Mount Seir, of K- to Kadesh Barnea. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them. After he had defeated Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Asheroth, and in um, Edre. Beyond the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law, saying, The Lord your God said to us in Horeb, or Sinai, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and to all their neighbors in the Arabah, in the hill country and uh, in the lowland and in the Negeb, and by the seacoast, the land of the Canaanites, Uh, and location, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. See, I have set the, the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land. And the Lord swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and to their offspring after them. So there is the promise that they are supposed to go in and take possession. Remember, we've moved from one generation that has been wandering and now to another generation. So let's go down to verse 2. Um, these are the words that Moses spoke, verse 1. Verse 2, it says, It is 11 days' journey from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. So it should take 11 days for them to get from Mount Sinai, where God was sending them, to get to Kadesh Barnea, the promised land. How many days did it take them? What does it say in the next verse? 40 years. So this wasn't that they got lost and the husband wouldn't ask for directions. This was different. And they call it the, wiz- the, the wilderness wanderings. They are going all over the place. They backtrack, they circle around, they wander from side to side. They're all over the place. And maybe that's been the story of your life. You've gone from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, but it's never gone the right direction. That might be the case, um, but whatever the case is, they have uh, made an 11-day journey um, into 40 days. You heard about the rancher, uh, the big Texas rancher, and he has this guy from... We'll say from the Philippines come, and they're comparing farms. And the guy, you heard this one? The guy from the Philippines says, man, you, you have a big farm. And he says, yeah, well, how, how big is your farm, the, the Texan says. Well, if you see that power pole over there, and make that about a square. That's, that's my farm. The Texan just laughs, and he says, well, if you got in a truck, and you took off, and you drove, starting now, and you drove till about 8 o'clock tonight, you still wouldn't reach the end of my property. And the guy from the Philippines said, boy, yeah, I I know what you mean. I had a truck like that, too. (laughs) It was a Ford. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, yeah. This is uh, not that. They were disobedient. They grumbled against the Lord. And you can get that story, how they did not want Moses to be their leader, did not want Aaron. They, They disobeyed God constantly. They whined and complained. But look at what happened in the wilderness. We're also going to be reminded that God took care of everything there. Correct? How did they eat? Manna from heaven and quail. Um, God gave them water from a rock. Now I want you to think just for a second, do a little research, how much food it would take to look after a nation of over a million people. If you were to try to feed Saskatchewan every day for 40 years, think about it. Train loads of food train loads of water. God feeds them from the heavens and from a rock. God says that their, their clothes and their sandals never wore out. This is a group of people that never worked a day in their life. Think about that. Just think about it. And then God's sending them into, into a promised land where they're going to plant vineyards, they're going to farm. And for a generation that had never experienced that, never, they've been given everything. And now they're going to be told to go in conquer, fight battles, uh, go to war, and, and fight and take over farms and cities and do all these different things, imagine what that was going to be like. It's going to take some effort. This is terrifying, honestly. 
this would have been scary. So let's get a little bit about what the book of Deuteronomy. So we know that they wandered for 40 years in the 40th year, verse 3. And on the first day of the 11th month, let's just pause there for a second. This is when Moses is going to get up to talk. On the first day, let's just say, what's the 11th month? November. They don't go on our calendar. I get that. So don't somebody phone in and do that. The first day of the 11th month. Let's say this is the the 1st of November. Now let's go to Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. This is when they actually enter into the promised land. So Moses has stopped them before going to the promised land. And he says, just wait a minute. I want to remind you of some things here before we go into the promised land. And that's when he stops them on the first day of November. And uh, verse 19 uh, of chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4 verse 19. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month. And they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. So how long did it take them? So this would be the 10th day of January. Give me about how many days? Oh, burp. 70. We got 70 days. So they've wandered for 40 years. Now Moses says, stop. Before we go in, there's some things I want to remind you of. There's some things we need to focus on before we go in. We need to be ready to go in here. And when we go in, we're going to take 70 days to think really carefully about what God wants, what God is like, what God is capable of. And we see that. Remember, we're going to see that down here. He killed the king of Bashan, Og, and and all these different things. He reminds them of victories in the past, how he delivered them out of Egypt, all these things. But he also reminds them of how he wants them to live. And so if we're going to move forward together, let's stop and be really clear about what God wants. And I think that's very important here. And he's going to do that for 70 days before they enter in. And so for this 70 days, he is going to do what verse 5 says. Back to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 5 now. He is going to explain to them. These were the words, according to verse end of verse 3, that the Lord had given him, and the Lord had commanded him to give to the people. After he had defeated Sihon, so he saw some victories here. Verse 5, beyond the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain the law. Now that word, underline it. This is really important. Explain is just to make clear. So it's, it, if someone explains something to you, you understand it more clearly, correct? That's, that's what it is. But it's also more than that. It's to make it unique or to make it stand out from other things. So what Moses is going to do here, actually, is he's going to take parts of what is written in Exodus and Leviticus, and he's going, to, he's going to elevate some of those things. He's going to explain why some of those things are so important. He's going to make sure that the things that stand out are understood clearly. One more thing that's part of the root word for explain in Hebrew is to engrave, or to basically to etch it into a tablet. Get that picture? How did they get the Ten Commandments? They were engraved by God. God engraved it for them so that they could have it. Now, he, he, God has also made a promise for the future. You see, God makes really clear why they couldn't obey him. Why they constantly rebelled. It was a heart issue. And so, God is going to remind them in the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Jeremiah, that I will engrave or I will write these words on your heart. He says he's going to do that in the future. He's going to have to change our heart. This has happened for us because of the work of Christ. So praise the Lord for that. We don't, we don't have to fear, um, you know, just constantly living in rebellion. We can have a heart change through the work of Christ. And the work of the Holy Spirit drives us forward, moving us forward in our faith. And so this is the whole understanding. When he's explaining it to them, he's wanting it to engrave this on your heart. Make this part of your life. Make sure that you understand it. You can, you can explain it to somebody else. If you understand something clearly, you can explain it to somebody else, right? So that if you pass on information, that means you can do something with it. And this is what, what's being told for the people of Israel at this time. Moses wants them to understand it so that they can explain it to the next generation, that it will shape the way that their life, it's ingrained on their heart, um, and and those things, that it is going to make them live unique from all the other nations around them. Okay, now let's go to verse 6. The Lord our God said to 
uh, said to us at Horeb, these are the things that Moses is going to explain, you have stayed long enough at this mountain, no kidding, and then they wandered for 40 years, uh, turn and take your journey and go to the hill country of the Amorites and the hill country and the neighbors in the Arabah, the hill country, and, um, um, and in the lowland and in the Negeb and by the seacoast, the land of Canaan, the Canaanites, and Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. What kind of people were in the land? Giants? They knew that already, actually. We saw that in verse 4. So they, they didn't really need spies. God had already defeated some of the people before them. They were, they were trying to go through to the promised land and people would not give them passage. That's what's said there in verse 4. Those people that were defeated, first of all, by Moses. Um, the Lord gave them victory there uh, so that they could have safe passage. And so God had delivered them once already to show them his faithfulness. But he's also calling them to go into a pretty scary land, okay? And just so you know, a spiritual journey is not an easy journey. Amen to that, anyone? Is it easy to grow in your faith? No. So if you embark on a spiritual journey and you say, oh, I'm going to, maybe you remember that. Maybe you came to Christ later in life and said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dedicate my life to Christ. It's not an easy decision, is it? If you, you're, you're entering into something that you're not sh- really sure what you're signing up for here. But God's calling us to go into life um, to face monumental tasks. Maybe it's a family who does not agree with you. Maybe it's uh, friends that just look at this like this is ridiculous. Maybe you're thinking, what is God going to change in my life? I don't want to do that. I'm comfortable the way I am. Just think of all the things that the Israelites had. And this, I think, is the condition of, of the North American church in particular today. Pretty happy with our church. I'm pretty happy with my cars, my sandals that never wore out. I'm pretty happy with my house. I'm pretty happy with all these different things. Why would I go somewhere else? Why would I grow? And that's really the condition of many people's hearts, and that's why we're not growing. God intends for us to move forward in our faith. Look at verse 8, and then we're going to take you to one more passage as we close off. See, I have set the land wide open before you. God has called you to something way bigger than settling, to complacency, um, or to being stagnant. See, I have set the land wide open before you. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give to them and to their offspring after them. This is going to be a generational thing. I want to encourage you fathers with that last statement. You, You may... Look at your life, and you may say, I have blown it. I, I, I want, any father want your sons, your daughters, to surpass you spiritually? Do you want that? I hope you do. I, I want to encourage you that you give them a starting point. But your life is the, the starting point that your children will have. So you need to be growing as a father so that you can encourage your offspring to go from your starting point on further than you. And that's what was going to happen as they would go and take possession of the land. They didn't just go in, storm through it all. The whole, that first generation saw every bit of victory. It was generation after generation after generation that pushed forward. We won't see everything in one year. You may see incredible victories and incredible blessings of God poured out on your children and your grandchildren that you didn't get to see in your life. But be okay with that. Your heritage, your Christian heritage, is passed on to your offspring, to your grandchildren. So pray for your kids, encourage your kids, teach your kids, challenge your kids, push your kids forward, and make sure that they're living in a way that honors the Lord because of the example that you have given them. And so push your Push your kids forward to move even further than you ever were able to. There's my encouragement to you fathers. Let's go to the book of Philippians as we close. And this is where I think I want to focus on as we study the book of Deuteronomy together. Philippians chapter 3. We're not going and taking over a land here. Let's be clear. But God is pushing us forward. Um, Actually, let's start in verse 10. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. Verse 8, even better. We'll go even more. 
Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I'm not comfortable where I'm at. Uh, For this sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I already have obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, uh, forgetting what lies behind, and, stra- um, and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 12 to 14 are going to be our theme verse as we move through the, the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to come to um, come up against this term over and over again, listen and love. Basically, what God calls us to and calling us to obedience, and then we respond to him in love. Chapter 6, it has the Shema. Shema, O Israel. And it's, remember the Lord. Listen, hear, O Israel. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall have no other gods before me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That is, that's our goal. And that's what God is calling them to. Love God, pursue Him, press into Him, and go after Him and Him alone. Father God, we press on. Not that we've already attained these things, but we strain and we move forward. Father, I just pray specifically today for the dads here. It can be a disheartening thing to know that our tempers have got the best of us. We've sometimes blown it with our kids. We've been too strong. We have exasperated our children. Um... We missed opportunities, but Father, from this point on, I pray that you would be stirring in our hearts to, to grow with the intention that we would have an example and a legacy to leave our children. Father, for our children, would they be a generation who is going after you? Uh, the teenagers who are going in to take over the land, who are going into life and moving forward, I pray that they would be moving forward in a way that honors you. For the children as they look and as they prepare to go into into life and as they go into school and are spending time with friends realizing that they are set apart they're different than everyone around if they're going to follow you lord we recognize that there's going to be massive massive challenges to moving forward in faith with you and yet we also recognize that there is incredible blessings that we will serve and are entrusting our lives to a god who cares deeply about us who has sacrificed much for us, and who has prepared um, great things for our life. Those things are not easy, and yet we recognize, Father, that we walk with you through them. And so we thank you for your presence. We thank you for uh, your spirit, which walks with us and moves us and, and encourages us and counsels us and also rebukes us. We thank you for your word that makes clear um, the things that honor you and dishonor you. It makes clear also the type of God that you are. And so we pray that we would be reminded of these things as we study. Just challenge us to press on and to press forward in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're glad that you can be here again. Um, It has been uh, great to be in the Word again. Um, I hope that uh, uh, you're encouraged. Maybe uh, in the future, just, just so you know, if you're coming to church and you're here today, you don't have to phone Linda. We're just going to assume you're coming. If you're not coming, though, just let Linda know. Um, If you can do that, if you're not going to be here on a Sunday, if you can just let Linda know that, just cut down on the number of emails that uh, you need to do. Does that sound fair? Yep.